There's an elephant in the room, boys and girls, and I'm not talking about that elephant. I'm talking about the fact that we all use these batteries nowadays, and we don't have good ways to evaluate what's going on inside the cell. We don't know how it impacts the performance of our tools, or if you have a lot of practice, you might, um, but we have a lot more information that we could discover that helps us design our power electronics to have the appropriate battery and to have performance that meets the, the targets that we're after. And so what you just witnessed was a test using uh, a, a non-typical type of instrumentation where I didn't have to buy any sensors. All I did was compare the sound when I used the two and the four amp hour batteries. And what I got was um, an increase in that frequency, which corresponds to an, equi in, an increase in the speed of that motor. So there's a brush DC motor inside of there and obviously our impact has, our performance has been impacted and we get plus uh, 6% just by switching those two batteries. Mind you that the voltage is the same. So I hope this video is able to dive in and show what's going on inside the cells to help you make your decisions about how you use your batteries and how you might design machines when you're needing this portable power. Let's talk about the anatomy of these batteries. Inside is uh, several of, are several of these 18650 cells. It's usually gonna be Panasonic or Sanyo. They're good quality, they're competitive, and they're made at scale, providing data sheets to the engineers who put these together. And then you have two terminals that do most of the work for this battery. We can see positive and negative marked, and then you can get any old adapter or build your own to receive the positive and negative. Okay, and in my case, I just have this capped off, and then we're gonna say, hey, let's measure the voltage. So the watt meter says, right now, I've got 19.9 volts, and this one watt is just being consumed by uh, the LED screen and the function, the microcontroller inside of here. So now we can pass the current out and hopefully through this video, we'll enable more people to create creative stuff. Um, like this is a, a product for a truck lamp. It's all aluminum, weatherproof, long lasting thing, much better than what you could purchase as far as lights, uh, like, in the power tool aisle of your store. And yeah, you can definitely run these for a long, long time. We're pulling 15 watts. As you'll see soon, that's a lot less than most of the tools themselves. For the rest of this video, I will be using actual instruments to provide you data. But for the previous clips, if you're curious and you don't have these instruments, then this is what was going on and, and I'd love to share it. So there's an app uh, available called Sonic that can produce a tone and you can adjust the tone anywhere you need. Then you can just listen and compare the tone that you've produced with the tone that you're hearing from your tool and then you can learn something about the speed of the machine. These are the frequencies that I measured by listening. And so we're going to round these to 1600 and 1700. And hertz means cycles per second. But we actually uh, want to know the rotations per minute because that's what we're familiar with. So then we multiply by 60. That yields for us 96K and 102K RPMs, something per minute. And the reason I say something is because these values are higher than probably anything you have in your home. Those are very fast speeds for any machine. So then we do a little thinking. Things that rotate once often wobble twice. And things that wobble, wobble back. We know our sound comes from vibrations in the air that come from a vibration of some material in the machine. 
So it's feasible. I think that we're getting four wobbles for every rotation. If we take the RPM of our sound and then we divide by four, that would give us 24K and 25K um, actual RPM. We think that that motor is spinning. Honestly, the vacuum is one of the harder tools to evaluate by audio just because it's so noisy. But in this case, I chose it because it was safe to operate uh, at full load while doing some multitasking. And if you want to geek out, you can download other apps like Decibel X, and it gives you a lot of information about the sound profile of a tool. And just for that's what we get with the vacuum. These ratings, such as the amp hours and the voltage, are informative, but not honest. I'm referring to all the brands across the board. Now, um, in some cases, like Rigid is, like I found to be much more honest in general. So you can trust this when the battery is new. You're gonna get 1.5, maybe a little less, and that depends on uh, how much current you're drawing. I'll, dive into that soon. So the size of the battery does reflect something about its capacity. It also will come to mean how many, um, how many volts you can get under load. Uh, let's get into the behavior of these things. Now one hour is one hour and one amp is one amp, but not every amp hour is equal. Get ready for this. Okay, so what we've done is we've taken a battery and we've hooked it up to receive its two terminals. We're powering it on and then we're going to send that power to an instrument that can draw different amounts of current and then measure voltage as we go. This is what you get when you discharge a power tool battery like this one. We start without any load, zero amps, and we have nearly 20 volts. This is how DeWalt gets away with claiming their batteries are 20 volt batteries, but they're really not. They're the same as the other brands. All right, and as soon as we begin to draw four amps, we have dropped down by almost a volt, 19 volts. And then over time, the voltage drops. Y axis is voltage and this axis is time. In the first 20 minutes, we have delivered 24 watt hours. So in the 40 minutes, that should be double. It should be over 48. And then you see at 40 minutes, we've only delivered 47 watt hours. So if your battery has full charge here and is empty here, and you've tested at one amp of current, discharging for two hours, then yes, you do have a two amp hour battery, yes, but the energy delivered in these two hours is different. So the energy here, if it was uh, 20, 15, and 10, then the watt hours would be the volts times the current times the time. So you would have the average 17.5 watt hours, whereas this one's only 12.5. All that means suddenly you can come back to the claim on the cell and say, how honest is this company? We had 18 volts and four amp hours rating. And that means we should get four amps times 18 volts, this many watt hours. 72 is what they're really claiming. And then that's rigid. Here we have DeWalt, if you buy a four amp hour battery, and they're saying that we're 20 volts, so we're claiming 80 watt hours. And that's a big fat lie. Next, we can ask, how much power does my power tool need? Or in the case of mechatronics, how much power does any actuator need that we're working with? So 
this simple adapter is giving us contact with two terminals on the two positive and negative terminals of my tool. And then we have a nice 16 gauge hefty wire to make sure we're not limiting the current there. These terminals could be done better. Um, I happen to know we're not, we're not creating too much resistance, but this setup for this tool, but it can be more, you can, we can do better than that. Um, anyway, so now we're gonna measure. All right, we have, uh, let's get this lighting good. All right, um, two watts just to do nothing at all. And then let's fire it up. So we're gonna rotate this guy. Now it's a kind of minimal trigger pull. And we're getting 0.35 amps, about eight watts. We're gonna go up somewhere around the middle, 20 watts. Now full power. And you'll notice we've dropped down to 19.55. That's the most you'll get when you're drawing 60 watts. Then, when you quit adding a load to the battery, it's gonna go back up to 19.75. This battery is indicating for us that it's still near full capacity. I believe that these are usually just measuring the voltage and not the it's not doing any intensive mathematics estimation like your phone does when it's estimating its battery. Um, and it's very likely that the last two, um, the last two indicator lights are, are describing less remaining time in use than the first two. Now you can start to see that given a full charge, we might have something like 19.5 volts. And then when we apply a load, then we drop the voltage to something, I don't know, call it 18.5. It very much depends, uh, depends on how much current you're drawing, how much power you're drawing, and the, the behavior of the batteries. But in general, for call it, if you give plus or minus 10%, all of the batteries in this industry are gonna be similar. Um, except for borderline cases, edge cases. 50% uh, battery, maybe that's 18.5. Um, don't quote me on that, but it's lower. It's significantly lower. And when you draw a load, again, it's gonna drop down further, or maybe by the same margin, but further than this. So call that 17. You will notice if you're drawing power from a monster of a tool like this reciprocating saw and you're low on battery at some point the voltage drops down enough that the battery says no and it'll blink that light and it'll say i'm giving you zero volts no more voltage available and potentially you can pull that out of the tool again if you rest just a little bit it may recover a small amount of voltage and if you put it in a more lighter, uh, more lightweight load, then this tool will be able to operate for a little while longer. And here's how that looks. Inside the machine, you've got, sorry, inside the battery, you have a battery protection circuit. So at some low voltage indicated, uh, decided by the designers, then we're calling this the zero state of charge and the battery protection circuit is going to cut off power going out from the circuit at that level. The two ways to get there are, A, that you have a fair amount of uh, capacity left, but you draw a very heavy load, and a very big tool can do that, and so that gets you a no-go, and it will stop right there. The other way is that your state of charge is initially already low, and then you draw a small amount of current. And this also will be uh, give you the cutoff condition. What that story means is that your tool is not participating 
in the inter the decision making for whether it's running or not and whether it's running fast or slow and whether it's running with a high current or not the full trigger pull says i want all of the current available for this given motor and that's basically just uh, a closed contact path from here to well in this case of a brushless tool um, it's going to the uh, brushless motor driver full power full voltage or in the case of the brush tool you can consider this to be uh, full closed circuit to the motor almost directly there may be just a couple of lights or minor things um, that are pulling away from that full voltage and then inside this battery uh, protection circuit this is very similar to how it looks inside of that pack um, you have let's see terminals of 0 volts 4.2 volts 12.8.4 and 12.6 that's reflecting the the three cells in in uh, series for the, this case is 3S. I think those ones are 4S or 5S. Um, so one cell at the very peak voltage is 4.2 on lithium ion. And then, so this terminal traces to the positive cell, the positive terminal of a given cell, or maybe multiple cells in parallel, and it's not too critical for the function of this. The job of this is to, when we're discharging, we're making sure that the cells don't go too far out of balance, and the same as charging. And then to cut things off if we have conditions such as too hot, too cold, too much current, too low voltage on any given cell, or too low voltage on the full pack. The fact that these battery packs are making so many decisions for you and protecting the cells means that it, it enables designers to try out different stuff. So here we have a radiator fan. It's literally designed for automobiles, 12 volts to maybe 14 volt battery while charging. That's what powers these ordinarily. And we can just say, hey, let's try it out. This is at risk. It's a $20 fan, okay. And so we take the power from the cell. We, oh my gosh, sorry about the, the wires is quick test. Okay, so we're saying, all right, let's go to the terminals. Let's go to this governor or PWM speed controller or no governor at all. You could just hook it up and we can say, all right, let's 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 see if uh, this functions on this, how much power it draws, how long does it last. Um, so this is a percentage on pulse width. All right, we're pulling 30 watts. No problem at all for the battery. Feels good because it's hot in here. And then 50%. 85%. 110 watts, 19 volts. So for this setup, battery versus radiator fan, it's cheap, it's robust, it works. Um, now, will the fan last under a higher voltage than designated? Who knows, but in the automotive industry, parts tend to be a lot more robust than the electronic toys. So, getting to experimenting, uh, I recommend it. Now let's dive into charging and look at the conditions we see with charging a battery that is mostly empty. Okay. So some of these chargers, instead of having the converter inside, they come with a, a wall wart. So this unit is rated at 18 volts and 60 watts. But I measured it right away. The open circuit voltage is 21.4, so no load. We're passing that into these terminals and down to our meter. And our meter is powered externally so that uh, we're not drawing any power just by using the meter. Next, we're going to plug the meter into this charger and begin to take a look.
at the start with no battery. We have a light coming on and I guess there's less than a fraction of a watt. So we're gonna hook it up and it's gonna evaluate and start charging. We have eight watts climbing up to 33 and it looks like it's gonna perform a steady charge around 33 watts. Um, so you've no you can notice while we're drawing nearly two amps, we have this voltage incoming at only 17.5. So we have, uh, without any communication to that wall wart, it has dropped the voltage because of the load that's being applied. It's not, uh, the voltage drop is due to the load. Um, then I suspect that 17.53 is very close to the terminals on this battery itself while it's charging. I think that when we measure this, well, we can go ahead and do this. So what is the voltage of, well, sorry, there's circuitry in between here. A circuitry in this charger might prevent us from knowing the battery voltage directly. Yeah, it's gonna shut off to zero, whereas Call this 16.5. And so what we have is the adapter coming down and the battery voltage coming up to meet at the voltage where the charging is going to happen. And then this will gradually climb over time until we get to 20 point something. We can measure using this setup what uh, speed of charging we'll get approximately with this other type of charger. And what you measure here, just keep in mind that this is before the conversion to DC. So now we have 97 watts that is exiting this outlet, but we're measuring before the DC conversion. We have a higher power going in here, but not as high as this. Previous charger was giving us 30, 35 watts. Maybe this is 70 or 80. So since this charging station just needed a DC supply, somewhere 18 to 21 volts, that means anywhere that I can come up with 18 volts DC, I may be able to do some charging. And so now we're getting only six watts at 18 volts. But that's pretty great. This is a cheap $25 10 watt solar panel from Amazon. The reason this solar setup is relevant to talk about is because it's more efficient than bringing your power over to AC and then moving it back to DC. You have two losses. And so if we took something very low power like this 10 watt guy and then converted it to AC and plugged in the other charger, we're going to get so much loss it will it would be a negligible amount of charge that you're actually collecting let's come back to the discharge unit here cba and take a look at what we get on the voltage side when we're drawing different loads i'm doing this test in real time so um, we're monitoring at 20.7 volts and i'm going to set it up from zero amps up to Four amps. And you'll watch the live data. We've come down to 20.2 volts, but it's a pretty strong battery. And it'll stay near steady and only decline as fast as the battery is actually losing its, uh, its energy. Then we come back down and we go, let's do eight amps. Well, first let's come back to zero. Zero, set. Now it jumps back up. It takes a few seconds. And that's that residual change. Uh, it just takes time. There's internal um, resistance in the battery and I'm sure some other phenomena related to the chemistry and the fine details, but Give it a few seconds. All right, now we're at a steady 20.6, almost back to where we were. Now we go to eight amps and set. Okay. 
8 amps drops us instead of 20.12 <clears throat> we get 19.6 now let's jump up to 12 make this 14 whatever 14 oh sorry 12 and we're going to get another drop And you can see the. So when I tried to jump up to 12, uh, it actually limited it at 10 point something. And I just realized this tester may be limited to 250 watts. I thought it was 500, um, but we can see 10 amps. And the other thing is the voltage is dropping a lot less than uh, my previous tests. And that is because, let's check this out real quick still above 19 volts that's incredible um so this is not super reflective of your typical battery but this one is the maximum output so i guess this is uh this is actually a different setup in internally there's a meaning to that max output so what you get is um some data points if you want to characterize your battery under different loads at the 100% state of charge, we're fully charged. At zero amps, we're getting certain a certain voltage. Draw four amps, and it drops down a certain amount. And this is a test done quickly so that we're not draining the battery. Then for a four amp hour cell, we said, well, let's move over to 75%, which is a, a nominal type of designation I gave it. We said, after we draw one amp hour, then what is the performance? And we go uh, to have on the first test, here's our full charge under different loads, up to 12 amps. It drops all the way to 17.9 for the non-max output, ordinary battery, four amp hour. Then if we draw one amp hour from the cell and we do the test again, these are our new numbers. Draw two amp hours and then test again and draw three amp hours and test again on a four amp hour cell. This map characterizing the battery tells us why we cannot just measure a voltage and determine how much charge is left in your battery. Yes, if you have already characterized the battery, you haven't had it in service too long so that's changed characteristics, and if you have no load on it, yep, you can just measure the voltage and then check um, what's your state of charge based on that. But if you're drawing some sort of current from the battery, the whole voltage profile changes. So this describes for you somewhat of how, for instance, a, a cell phone uh, software can estimate the charge left and the minutes left based on what it already knows about the battery and while it's drawing current. So it's measuring multiple things at once. Now, finally, if you do not have the capability to measure current in real time, but you can measure the voltage, then you have a setup where you wanna learn about the power pulled by an instrument or an actuator, and you've already characterized your battery. Suddenly now we can apply a load. We can observe the voltage. We can take our notes about this, come back to our map, come back to the characteristics of that battery, and then suddenly we know about the power voltage and current at a given condition of your actuator. And this is absolute magic, my friends. I did some very initial collection of data with how much power the tools consume uh, at full throttle under no load. So for example, with the grinder, it's not cutting anything or grinding anything, it's just spinning the wheel and it's pulling 142 watts. And so being able to observe this and then take a look at the tool, you can start to understand how much power it takes to do different functions. And this could be on the tool itself or it could just be on a new a brand new invention or an assembly um, so 
the blower is this unit here. And of course, the no load condition is, it doesn't exist because the, the air itself coming in through here is putting the load on the motor. So we have like 370 watts at the full throttle with uh, the max output battery. And most of these are with a typical um, nominal four amp, amp hour battery, fully charged. Um, the vacuum is a big power hungry unit and reciprocating saw 200 watts without any um, without any cutting being done so it was interesting to just do this quick study and uh, there are more tools i want to do a few more tests where i where i load up one of the tools do its cutting work and see how much does it increase if i go ahead and and uh, take the action the tool was designed to take and there are loads of variables like blade sizes and materials, et cetera, but, but we, we don't start to understand how much power things really take until we start measuring a little bit. I hope this content was informative for you. And as always, I may have made errors. Please chime in and share in the comments if you're aware of an error that I made or something that I left out. Um, if you see potential in one of the topics, there are miles deeper we can dive in on many of these things i love to collaborate and hear from other experts um, and non-experts people that are curious don't be shy about leaving a comment uh, i love to read them so thank you so much